us pray. Heavenly Father, make us into the, t- the type of people who can pray this prayer, this psalm, with our whole heart. We pray that you would pray in us through the Spirit of your Son. Amen. Well, I hope that you don't find three-point sermons as boring as I do, because I've got three points for you today, three <laughs> verses that stand out in this psalm. The first one is worship the Lord with gladness. You know, we worship God because he's good, not because he needs us to or anything like that, because he's good. Secondly, it is he who made us and we are his. We are happy when we understand that we are God's stuff, that we are his property. And third, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. The point of our life is thanksgiving. So let's go. Verse number one that I like, worship the Lord with gladness. Now, when I first moved to Toronto a while ago, there was this atheist on the hall I would hang out with, and we were walking down Hoskin Avenue one day, or Harvard, Harvard, Hoskin. I I lived on two different streets for a while, and they both started with H, and it's been like a couple years. Anyway, he told us, we're walking along, and he told us, this is utterly ridiculous that your God wants you to worship, wants you to worship him. Like, what, what kind of egomaniac is this guy anyway? And I think this is kind of a, a question we've all asked ourselves at, at one point or another. It came up in the youth group the other day, which was fun. Why do we grovel before this big being? Well, what is God? What is God? Is he like the Christian version of Zeus, a man up on a mountain. Most people still believe in God, but we can't take for granted that we all think the same thing about God. You know, I'll never forget this conversation I had with a friend of mine. I think I was back 20 years old. I was going through this, like, hippie phase. I wore floppier toques even than I do now. It had tassels on it. I looked totally ridiculous. I was out for coffee. Me... And this girl, and we got talking about creation, and and I just assumed, like, right, everyone knows that God's the creator. And no, she just didn't get it. Like, I'm going, before creation, there was no time, no matter, no stuff, nothing but God. And for her, that just didn't make sense. There always had to be stuff, and God was just kind of the biggest bit of stuff, the most powerful bit of stuff, like a thing in the universe of other things. For us, though, biblically, God is the explanation of everything. You know, I can imagine a world where I didn't exist, and where you don't exist, and where everything that exists doesn't exist. And so there's either an explanation for why there's something rather than nothing, or there's no explanation. But if there is an explanation, that explanation is God. He is the source of all things. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Another translation just says, I am the one who is. Or I am being. Being itself. So he exists, necessarily. And we don't. Our existence is on loan. So then, if God is the source of everything, why did he create? Was he lonely? Is he needy? No, we think God creates out of the goodness of his own heart. And God looked at everything he had made, and it was good. Creation is good because God is good. And we worship him because he's the source of all goodness. You know, why would we worship anything else but the source of goodness? Are we supposed to worship the source of evil? Of course not. So Christians worship the Lord with gladness because he is capital G, good. And this is tied together with the fact that he's capital B, beauty. You know, all the harmonies and colors and shapes and forms of of nature, all the snowflakes and every solar system and soul that God's created is beautiful. And every good thing that we do, whether it's an act of forgiveness or self-sacrifice or love, All of that expresses God's beauty. You know, if we stare at the sunset or at a great piece of art, 
Why don't we stare at God's beauty? Well, we do. That's what worship is. That's what worship is. So moving along, it is he who made us, and we are his. So worshiping the creator means that we know that we are creatures. And this, I know Christians always like to say this is countercultural, but it really is countercultural. We are God's creatures. That means we don't own ourselves. We're God's possessions. We are his stuff. We don't choose to be born. We don't choose to die. And everything in between comes as a gift from God. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And if you don't know that God is good and loving and faithful, then you have to take care of yourself. It's all up to you. And if you don't experience life as a gift from God, then you're going to experience it as a burden. Because so much of it is out of our control. Gifts are out of our control. And God wants to give you so much, but your hands have to be open to that. You know, it's all a matter of perspective. If you don't know that you're a creature, you won't be able to get the good things that God is sending you, even if those things come through trouble sometimes. Now, there's a reason why I really love talking about creation. And it's because without God, creation just seems like Well, it totally sucks. It's full of all sorts of inequalities, power imbalances. Our bodies hold us back. I've always got a stomach ache or backache or headache all the time. Our families hold us back. I can't just go surfing all the time. And I gotta, you gotta go to work. You gotta work for your family and do that kind of stuff. Changing diapers, whatever. (laughs) But we want control. We want more control. We want more freedom than that. And that's why sometimes we don't like this world that God has created. We don't like it. One of the main ways we try and get control is through money. We try to protect ourselves with stuff. And Jesus told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said to him, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Does this sound familiar? This describes me. This describes me. Except for I don't have big grain grain bins. But every time, every time I start trying to control my life in this kind of way, I always run into this other passage. And the feeling that comes over me, every time I hear this passage is like, what? Why didn't I think about that? But it, like, it fills me with peace. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? That always pops up into my life just at the right time. And man... It's a challenge, but it does, it brings a sense of peace, right? The happy person truly is able to let go of their worries. Just let go of those controls and trust God. Trust God. It is he who made us and we are his. Thank God for that. So the next passage. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Thanksgiving is the point of life. It's central to who we are as Christians. Our whole life comes from God. So we give him thanks for everything he sends. And giving thanks implies giving. Thanksgiving. Giving. We can only give what we've got from God. I want to go through three things that we give. Obedience, alms, 
and Holy Communion. See what I'm doing here? I've just turned this into like a six-point sermon because there's sub-points. Get out your pens and notepads and just like drop down menus in your minds. It's getting complicated. Obedience. Obedience. When you have nothing else to give, you give your strength to God. You know, will our country be changed for the better if we put the Ten Commandments up in our courtrooms? Well, maybe. But the point of the commandments isn't to change the world because only Jesus saves the world. That's not your job. What the commandments help us do is they give us ways to just say thanks. Thanks for saving me. And we don't even have to invent ways to sacrifice ourselves. God's already just given them to us. Hey, just give me your tongue. Tell the truth. Give me your hands. Give up violence. Give me your desires, don't covet, and so on. The Christian is a living sacrifice of thanks. That's what we are. Alms. Now, alms are different than offerings. Offerings, they keep the church running. They help us do our mission. But alms, they go straight to the poor. Alms, they go straight to the poor. And in the Bible, if there's anything close to buying a ticket to heaven, it's alms. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. So the poor are the ones who take our money directly to God. That's the only way your money is getting to heaven. It's through them. And if you're interested in more of this, go to YouTube afterwards Search Gary Anderson. He's a New Testament guy. He'll give you all the details on this. It's, it's really cool. All of the biblical verses that are talking about like how much God loves you to give to the poor. His name's Gary Anderson. Finally, Holy Communion. What else do we call it? Well, we call it the Eucharist, which just means Thanksgiving. That's what it means, Thanksgiving. Now, in the old days, I, I think the church would probably just gather up their grain and their grapes and make some bread and wine. And it came straight from the community, right? That's why some churches these days say the same thing when they bring up the bread and wine as they do when they bring up the offering. In in old-timey language, they'll say, Thine own of thine own have we given thee. And what they're saying is, we're only giving you back the stuff that you've already given us. So here's our food, here's our money, here's our very life, our livelihood. And then the pastor blesses it and gives it back to the people. And it's this like giving and receiving cycle that we have going on from God, right? This is what it means to be a Christian. The whole Christian life is summed up as thanksgiving. Everything we do is Eucharistic. Thanksgiving. It's the core of who we are. So now as I'm sort of drawing to an end, just I want to wrap things up, just give you a few reminders to meditate on a little bit. Like, do you worship a good God? Is your God good? What do you think about God? Is your God good? Then worship him with all of your heart. Are you glad that you are his? Then give him your worries. I have to remind myself that all the time. Give him your worries. He's your defender. He loves you. He is faithful. You are God's property. Are you thankful for his gifts? Then give him loyalty and obedience. Give him alms to the poor and give yourself at the Lord's table. And that's what we're here to do today. That's the next part of the service we're going into. Amen?